Sometimes people just don't get a good start in life. And when the worst kind of trauma happens, it can create total monsters. In this terrifying case, a messed up home life created a freak who was a major threat to teenage boys for almost 30 years. But is he still out there? Well, let's find out. On December 9th, 2003, police were investigating a dark, creepy basement in Hammond, Indiana. Several local teenagers had gone missing, and now the police had narrowed it down to a suspect. But there was still just one major problem. They couldn't find any bodies, and they weren't really sure where to start looking. They were pretty sure they were under the basement, but it would be tough to dig up the whole thing at random, so they brought in a cadaver dog. That's a puppy specially trained to find dead people. I'm sure dogs have nicer jobs, but he did it well. The dog they used was a giant pupper named Ammo and his partner, Dale Bach, a canine unit detective. They were sent down into the creepy basement and Ammo got to work. Dale explains what they did. So I put the dog into the basement and gave him this command to search. And he went to a corner of the house. He went to the far corner of the house and just stood there and barked. Emma was trained to do some excited digging if he sniffed out anybody. But Dale was baffled because Emma wouldn't do that. Instead, he just barked and barked and barked at the same spot. Still, his partner was pretty sure that the cops should dig right there, just in case. A week later, Ammo and Dale were called back to the creepy basement. The cops had begun to drill under the concrete floor in a couple of places, but they still hadn't found anything. They needed Ammo's powerful nose to solve the case. This time, Ammo did exactly what he'd been taught to do and began scratching and digging at the southwest corner of the basement. That's where one of the holes had been drilled, only the cops didn't film it like they were supposed to. As a professional, Ammo and his partner asked for a second tape. Never work with children or animals, am I right? The investigators set up the video this time and sent Ammo back, but he went to another hole, so they had to dig up two areas that could contain human remains. But that still wasn't enough. The cops had also called in a concrete expert who confirmed that a lot of concrete had been used there. Like more than you'd expect. That was pretty suspicious. They were also using a forensic entronomologist. That's someone who knows which bugs specifically like to hang around the deceased. These little buggers provide a helpful clue. You might be creeped out to hear that there were a lot of coffin flies in the spider webs. Gross. These experts had all figured out there was something worth investigating down there. After digging again, they sent Ammo back in for a third try. When they found him so excited, he nearly disappeared into the hole. Once they pulled him out, the pathologist found something terrifying. A human leg was buried down there wrapped in a plastic bag. After that gruesome discovery, they began digging like crazy and found two bodies in that area. On the other side was a third body. Now, this one was super weird. It had been encased in blue lead paint before being wrapped in plastic and finally, all that concrete. All sorts of awful stuff had been done to this body too. Trust me, you don't want me to get into it, but a pipe had been used in the worst way. Ultimately, three victims of a horrible crime were discovered. Their names were Nicholas James, 19, James Ragnall, 16, and Michael Dennis, 13. Yeah, the last victim was really young. But who is behind this awful discovery? Who could possibly do something so horrible? Well, like I said earlier, the cops already had someone in mind. The person who'd been renting that horror house was a man named David Edward Moss. And it was just the start of a dark investigation into a guy who would be known as Crazy Dave. What's even worse, what happened to those three teenagers could probably have been prevented. So first, here's a little background on David Edward Moss. He was born in Collinsville, Pennsylvania, way back in 1954. He had a pretty shocking childhood too. His father left the family when David was really young. He was a terrifying guy, so that was probably a good thing, or maybe not. 
David was left with just his brother and his mom, but she had her own major mental health issues. Unable to cope with him, she dumped him at a mental institution when he was just nine years old and almost never visited him again. To be fair, she was really in no state to look after anybody, but if David had been strange before, he got even more messed up after being dumped. And then when he was moved to a children's home at 13 years old, he experienced violations and even more trauma. When he became an adult a few years later, he was hired for a construction job with his uncle. This didn't last. After he crashed the company truck, he was fired. Then he tried to go and live with his mom, who was now in Chicago, but she threatened him with a blade and made him leave. So what do you do in 1971 when nobody wants you? Well, in David's case, he joined the US Army. By 1972, he was an army cook in Germany. It seemed he was doing really well in that job, and he even had a pretty decent service record and a very high bowling score. But those good times weren't going to last. Although things were going pretty good in the army and David Most really liked it there, there was a dark monster lurking inside of him just waiting to act. In 1974, he went through a military court marital after taking the life of 13-year-old boy James McAllister. The victim's mom, Christina Harding, is still haunted by David Moss's face when she saw him in that military courtroom. And of course, she was furious that he was only given four years of hard labor. David spent those years in Kansas and then got released into the real world. But he just couldn't seem to keep out of trouble or stay in prison. In 1979, he attacked a housemate with a blade, but somehow he got away with it by pleading not guilty. No, this makes no sense to me either. Then in 1981, he went all out to end the life of the creep who violated him in the children's home. Well, actually, it doesn't sound like he tried all that hard. He got distracted when he met a 15-year-old boy called Elgin Jones, who ended up drowning in a local quarry. Uh, yeah. Somehow, that didn't get him sent to prison either. The only awful thing he did that stuck was when he attacked a 14-year-old kid. That got him sent down for five years. While he was still in prison, the mysterious fate of Elgin Jones also caught up with him. David was sent to Illinois for trial over the Jones case, and it's pretty scary that the warning notes on his file read, bad guy, Gacy type. You know that notorious clown freak who they have on Netflix all the time? The authorities totally knew what he was capable of. The good news, he pled guilty for Elgin Jones and was supposed to serve a 35 year sentence, so it was all okay, right? Well, it's scary that David Moss had the self-knowledge to write this in his 2003 diary. When I got locked up in the army, and then especially when I got locked up in 1981, I knew I should never be let out again. When an inmate says he doesn't want out, I hope that somebody listens. He even wrote a five-page letter to the Illinois Department of Corrections, begging not to be released. Unfortunately, nobody listened to him, and that's why Ammo found three bodies in that creepy basement in Hammond, Indiana. Although David Moss bounced around secure prisons and mental health institutions, he was freed just 17 years later. In 1999, he was released 12 years early because at the time, good behavior could cut a heavy sentence in half, even if they were someone as scary as David. Just to reassure you, that isn't the case anymore. Most serious offenders have to serve at least 85% of their sentence, but in this case, that change happened way too late. But what could make someone so dangerous? The answer to that is right at the beginning and really close to home. Now, mommy issues are cliche for a reason. Not just in films like Psycho, in real life. An awful childhood can have awful consequences. That was definitely the case here. I mentioned earlier that he had been in and out of institutions and that his mom wasn't really able to look after him. Well, in court, David Moss's defense team presented a 66 page document explaining how he had become so dangerous. That basically meant that all the triggers for this mindset set David down a very dark path. His mother was described as disturbed, psychotic, functioning marginally, needy, and narcissistic. And these signs were there early on. His brother, Jeffrey Most, had seen him brutally take the life of a little squirrel with a baseball bat just to see how it felt. 
and later David also attacked his brother twice, nearly killing him both times. This might have been exactly why he was sent away while he was so young, and both his mom and his brother had advised that he should get the death penalty. While this isn't a good look for the family, I guess it is kind of understandable. And he even wanted that himself. That's sad and very scary. But for a while, it looked like the state would just take his life and put an end to his violence. In December 2005, David Most escaped the death penalty by pleading guilty. He was handed three life sentences for what he'd done to the boys found in the basement. While victims' families were still deciding how to feel about this, they didn't have long to process it because there was even worse news. In 2006, the convicted killer used a twisted bedsheet to take his own life, right after being told he would go to a state prison. It took him 27 hours to finally pass away. It's pretty amazing that after he'd done this, his mom said, I never hated David. I'm so sorry he killed himself. It made me see that I loved David more than I ever knew. It's a shame that she only realized that way too late to do any good for David or his victims, isn't it? He left a note behind where he confessed to everything and even apologized to the families of the boys. The only decent action that eventually came out of all of this horror was the David Moss case convinced authorities to make a register for his type of crime. In 2011, a new Indiana code stated that sex or violent offenders must register with local law enforcement authority to include a person convicted of murder. This register could have totally saved some lives if it had been enforced when David Most was released that first time. But since 2006, all that the families of his victims could do was try to live their lives. And at least the monster is gone for good and can't hurt anybody else. Which was kind of what he had wanted all along. Freaky, right? What do you think about this case? Did David Moss get off too easily after all the pain he caused? And was he really sorry for doing so many awful things? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below.